got through the initial stages of recovery from the suddenness and the awful shock of her death, it was widely agreed that there must be a memorial that was worthy of her, which was a hell of a task because Helen was very, very exacting. And there was this sort of really exciting and fun thing of going to Covent Garden or ordering the flowers, you know crazy quantities of flora and what have you, and arranging these in the church in a quite simple, kind of formal way, without sort of trying to be like Helen. What happened at the end was quite magnificent because everyone was encouraged to take armfuls of these beautiful Mediterranean flowers with them, and everyone did. And the scene was like um, a Stanley Spencer <laughs> resurrection because everyone left with part of Helen. We were looking out across Trafalgar Square and the whole of Trafalgar Square filled up with the colours, these magnificent colours that everyone had taken from the church. There is a celebratory thing, you know, and to have had that is a lot to do with the spirit of her and her kind of energy and I think people who met her really loved her and she was just like really good company. She was really funny, she was really clever and she was a really good artist. Helen Chadwick died in 1996 at the age of 42. This film uses her own words and the reflections of those who knew her well to celebrate her art and her life. I think the first word one thinks of when one's thinking of Helen is energy. She had tremendous energy, intellectual energy, physical energy. She would always be absolutely clear in what she was saying, whether it was bawdy and funny, highly intellectual, that she was describing something. She always had great precision. And also in the way she dressed, she always managed to make me feel rather scruffy and badly kempt. She was always immaculately turned out. Her physicality. That's what I remember her most for, because her personality really came through her body. For someone so small and unobtrusive personality-wise, you felt her presence very, very strongly when you were with her, but not in, in an overpowering way at all. She just empathised with you and you were there together as two little energy forces working off one another. That's what she was like. She always wore amazing clothes. I mean, she designed a lot of her own clothes, but I mean, she's very, very petite, and she always had incredibly well-cut hair. And one student that won the Helen Chadwick scholarship at the Royal College, he did a beautiful little kind of dissertation about Helen, and he just said, sharp mind, sharp haircut. And that so sums her up. <laughs> In 1994, Helen Chadwick recorded an extended interview for the British Library's Artist Lives Oral History Project. She recalled her father as a British soldier meeting her Greek mother during World War II. My mother was a war bride. She met my dad towards the end of the war and they fell in love. And... Uh, they wrote letters to one another. And then at the end of the war, when he was demobbed, he sent for her to be married. And then she arrived in Leighton during the Blitz, or after the Blitz rather, and it was completely bombed flat. And she thought she'd entered the underworld. 
I've got a younger brother, Chong, and he's a shepherd. I and mean, it's strange in a way because we're brought up in Croydon, mm. a sort of nice bungalow, and that became a nice semi detached, you know, proper sort of middle class ish backgrounds. But then he became a shepherd and I became an artist, which is probably a bit anomalous considering our backgrounds. But then with the Greek influence, I guess anything could have happened. I used to have lots of repeated dreams as a kid. And there are several things which are probably so sexual and Freudian. I'm loath to kind of talk about them, but I can remember I often was able to fly. And I can remember vividly the feeling of thrusting my arms behind my back to get lift off. I remember often being wrapped in an eiderdown and going around kind of in this eiderdown. I was often changing sex in dreams. I have a feeling that my alter ego was male. I remember the kind of muddy tub shit sensation of being in warm tubs of excrement and that kind of almost um, a shiver, which must be like a kind of infantile orgasm. I'd got it into my head that I was going to be an archaeologist. I suppose because of the influence of Greece. And my idea was that I would draw and document the finds and the sites so that I'd be able to use the kind of draftsmanship that I had or my interest in art. And when I was doing my A-levels, I had every intention of going to university to study archaeology and anthropology. But at the 11th hour, I decided to apply to art school and kind of keep both options open. I think it was really just the pleasure of making that won me over in the end. I made things that were documented by women wearing them, kind of sculptural clothes and artefacts, which then, as well as being documented on film, were then performed live as a way of making work that was more direct somehow. They were pre-punk, erotic artefacts, quite glamorous but also with a disturbing edge. I made these latex clothes that were made by painting it directly onto women's bodies, peeling it off so that, in effect, what I had were body skins that were then given buttons and zips and thongs so they could actually function as clothes. And I made complete outfits. I had volunteers shaving their heads there pubuses, their legs, everything, to um, be able to make skin casts. It looks like bits of old skin. So that issue of representing the body was there way, way back. After that, I went through a sort of more sociological phase where I became interested in the relationship of the individual to public or institutional structures. So what followed on was an installation called Train of Thought. I mean, the arena was travelling by tube, and what I was trying to explore were the intimate tensions between strangers. All that phase of working about issues, really, and incorporating other people so that their creative input was key, and I, if you like, was some kind of designer and the builder of the work, 
I sort of felt more and more alienated from my own sense of self. So I thought, well, it's time to actually do something more for me, about me, just my insanity. And I thought, well, embarrassment a go go, let's do something autobiographical. And that's how Ego Jimitra Sun began. I'd been documenting places where I'd spent my childhood and I identified these images and geometric forms that from the ket I wanted to enlarge and I had this idea that they should read as geometrical solids made of a solid material, I thought of wood. My idea was to somehow present the history as traces within the wood as a kind of equivalent to wood graining. There was a product that came out on the market as a novelty product for the photographic hobbyists called Silver Magic. And it was like a colloidal jelly with the silver bits that make something photosensitive. And anyway, the kind of leaflets with it claimed that you could paint it under safe light conditions onto any surface and expose a photograph directly onto that surface. And because the emulsion was transparent, it would be as if a photographic image could miraculously appear somewhere. Real kind of Turin Shroud, Veronica's Veil kind of stuff. I think if I could choose a work by her, it would be one of those. Because I think the technique she did of floating her image in the objects was just so inspired, really. And I thought, well, you do everything to perfection, but this one really has, you know, hit the nail on the head. I was sort of in awe of this meticulous sort of approach to work because she was so considered and most people I knew that worked that intensely and in such detail, their work usually had all the life sort of sucked out of it by the preparation, but hers never suffered from that. Hers actually gained a lot from it. And I think it was the way she sifted through information and the texture and everything was what gave the finished work such life and resonance with people in general. I think Helen's career was definitely marked out by landmark pieces. The first being Ego Geometria Sum, where she sort of distilled her life up to age 30 in these forms of the objects that had kind of surrounded her and, and formed her life from cradle to teepee to front door. Those, I think, then the oval court of mutability is an absolutely you know, magisterial work that really put her on the map. And that has the whole Helen kind of hedonism, the body, this whole notion of animal, vegetable, mineral, the matter that makes us up, all floating in this amniotic pool of these colour photocopies with these gold balls, the pillars. I mean, the whole shebang. This was Helen really laying down the gauntlet. I spent longer looking at art historical images and artefacts than I think I have ever done at any other time. It was really a stitching together of 
so many different references. I mean, ultimately postmodern, a kind of bowerbird theft of facets from everywhere, from architecture, from painting. And I guess I kind of commandeered these and sort of distorted them from my own ends so that you couldn't look at an image, say, of a woman being mounted by a bird. It wasn't quite a leader. For a start, the bird would be a goose rather than a swan. There were kind of ironies twisting their way in so that the conventional reading didn't account for the appearances. If one talks in these big, boring words like postmodernism, I think what postmodernism can mean is an interest in mediation. So you're not so much interested in the messages, how the message is conveyed. Helen is the European side of postmodernism because what she did was to renew deep artistic traditions in Europe. And it goes way past the Rococo. She used Rococo because she wanted to celebrate the transience of life, and Rococo was the perfect means to do that because it is so light, so frothy, so about the fleeting and the informal. But she reaches back into her Greek heritage on her mother's side by depicting herself as a kind of flying menad in the Oval Court. So there's a whole recapitulation of other moments in art. I think I liked, too, the fact that somebody could use a a photocopying machine, an office photocopier, and could, could just use this technology that is so potentially deadening and turn it into something so light and, and so perfect. It's quite wasteful, this method. I use several, I don't know, maybe I'll do 70, 80 photocopies of this tongue and then make a paste up from the best textures, the nicest textures under there. So I'm going to try and kind of twist it so I get the nicest bits. But it's okay while you're curiosity lasts but once you've really done all you need to do for a piece it does sometimes feel a bit revolting still the cat can tend to use the bits that I can't afterwards I very much see these as a kind of oracle for myself where I place things onto the copier and through that chance encounter with the glass plate the machine fixes something and I can then cut it together um, and produce an image that is totally fictional but might perhaps be a way of divining how one feels about things. I had to use dead animals, obviously, so they, they could be handled and placed in the right position. But the idea is that when they're finally laying out with the figure, you can create a kind of impossible juxtaposition. And yet there is a sense of them being alive. Here's a little white bait. I've put some together where there's a shift from the figure being seen against air and sky as if it's being seen against water. And this figure very much to me is coming up out of the depths. So I've used squid to suggest hair, to suggest waving movement of the water, little white baits swimming up towards the legs, rather like a kind of image of fertilization, and then a crab coming down here with its claws and moving on there's a skate which is the most extraordinary fish 
it had this terrible gaping hole where it had been gutted. And what I did was to try and present the skate as another equivalent for myself, as if I'm inside it. So my hands peek out from, from where its entrails have gushed out, as if kind of the figure's crouching inside, sort of begging or, or making some kind of bowing gesture. They're pure, and one can contemplate them almost like a true phenomenon, something that's permanent, something that's beyond change. Whereas the images are, they're elliptical, they dance, the references are kind of in and out. They have no absolute entity or meaning. It's so fragile that you can't really touch it. So I quite enjoy the decadence of wiping it with his feather. And you can see the little tiny bits just sort of floating off on the joins. This bit there. Mm. There's something... I don't know that the meaning would be unattainable, but perhaps something to aspire to, something to contemplate beyond the trivial, the changing. It's cyclical, there's no end to that. Hmm, look at the makeup. It's just dirt like any other now. I tell you, I did need gloves for this. I think it's actually quite exquisite, visually. I mean, I've seen paintings that haven't got the same tactile quality as this. You've got baked beans there. The Oval Court was first shown in an exhibition at London's ICA, in the room next to the installation of Carcass. top it up every day. I hadn't actually bargained for that, but the weight of it, all the kind of layers, seems to just keep sinking. So rather than have the levels going down over the course of the month, I think it's probably better to keep it nice and topped up. It was all the household waste from not just my house, about half a dozen in the street were collecting domestic compost for about nine months. I had no idea what the thing would look like. A sort of emblem of death and mortality, a kind of tower of corruption and decay. But what I hadn't anticipated was the fact that there would be this fermentation process, particularly with the weight compacting the lower, older material down, and it was constantly percolating bubbles. So ironically, it became more a metaphor for life, life than the oval court stretched out like a blue corpse in the next room. It was this complete about turn. I was trying to open up a territory for desire, how to depict desire and physical sensation and pleasure. And given that one's experience of that is through the body, it seemed to me that the body was central to the project. And I was aware of the wing of feminism, which I have perhaps unkindly called Stalinist, that was advocating absolute no representation of the female body was possible. 
And the idea of a denial of one's body as a no-go area to explore themes of sexuality and desire seemed so tortuous that although I could sympathise with the theoretical position, it just, again, didn't square with my own needs and choices that I wanted to make. And I felt it might just be possible, admittedly a tightrope act, to make images of the body but the self that would somehow circumnavigate that so-called male gaze. Helen always had a rather ambivalent relationship to feminism, I think. She certainly got herself in trouble with, you know, hardline feminists when she made works like The Oval Court or indeed Ego Geometria Sum, where she used her own very beautiful naked body in her work in a way that was very celebratory of her beauty, in a way that I think, you know, many hardline feminists found very problematic. She was a slightly different generation, so she in a way provided a bridge from more mainstream, earlier feminist movements and figures into artists working today. We don't even call them women artists now. Helen felt that she had no mentor. I think she was sort of quite angry about that, really, that there hadn't been more acceptance of what women were doing. And so it's why she was prepared to totally exploit and use her own body. And in fact, it has worked very well because there's still students that use her as their mentor now. She has influenced generations now of art students because she opened up literally her own body. Helen Chadwick made Blood Hyphen in 1988 and the piece was conceived for a chapel in Clerkenwell, the Woodbridge Chapel. At a certain point in the 70s, a full ceiling was put in which divides the space in two at gallery level. When Chadwick came along in 88, she was really interested in using the disused space um, above the full ceiling. There was one big problem, which was that the ceiling, the real ceiling above me, had sustained an awful lot of damage. So in order to recreate this piece, we actually had to rebuild the whole ceiling of the chapel. The journey that is required by the viewer to view Blood Hyphen is quite particular. And it's a really a very private experience that you're invited to take part in. Chadwick saw this kind of journey, the viewer progressing through the chapel and putting their head up through the full ceiling and into this darkened chamber as a metaphor for inquiry and examination, both scientific inquiry, religious inquiry, but also she talked about it as a form of gynecological inquiry. And the fact that the image which is shown in the photograph behind me is from the cervical smear test brings up that reference of medical inspection and treatment. And then that is combined with a laser which shoots down across the space. And she was making a number of different references in this piece. One reference obviously is to the Immaculate Conception which is often demonstrated in paintings as a shaft of light. That's a clear kind of reference to the religious nature of this site. But she was also referring to the use of lasers in the treatment of cervical cancer. So Javik responds to the site in two ways, one picking up on its spiritual associations and one picking up on its medical associations. Because as well as being a place of worship, the chapel has for a long time been the location of a medical mission. And it was that history, that dual history, that Chadwick was particularly interested in drawing out. The title of the piece, Blood Hyphen, actually comes from a description of the trickle of blood on Christ's torso after the wound has been made by the soldier's spear.
And Chadwick was interested in this idea of the trickle of blood being a kind of metaphor of the individual's passage through life from birth until death. At the end of the 1980s, Helen Chadwick was commissioned to make an artwork in a national park in Pembrokeshire. She combined photographs of the coastline with images of her own body tissue and with patterns made by staining canvases with paint poured in the sea. Helen felt that that was the most important work she ever made and I see it as hugely significant because it's still using her own body but it's not necessarily in the physicality of her own body. When she went to Wales and she made in the Pembrokeshire landscape those fantastic big sort of vannies and seascapes and landscapes and then she used her own body cells to actually put the viral landscape on the surface of those. I mean, she was washing these great canvases in the sea. I mean, she was, she was using her own body physically to make something that had never been done before. And she was using her own body cells. Do you have this sense of a coastline, if you like, being a boundary that's never stable? The sea, the land, the body is never stable. These were called the viral landscapes. They were made around the time when the whole AIDS epidemic really broke. So everyone was very aware of the sense of the body being this very permeable, porous reality. So it's still Helen very much exploring the interior and the exterior world and the relationship therein, but in what sounds very complicated from what I was saying, but also what are very beautiful, very easy to read images. How could I be an artist in National Park for Pembrokeshire? What a lunacy. No history or connection with Wales whatsoever no history of working with the landscape and in a way that forced me to think about how who I am could engage with a very particular landscape that's quite unfamiliar to me. So I kind of devised a project if you like that was very literally a synthesis between the landscape and my own self through merging cell tissue. I started off with my GP and asked him what bits of body I could have. And I imagined some, you know, highly charged biopsy samples from the inner woman. And there was no way that he was prepared or thought it ethical to do anything like that. But he was very happy to suggest parts of the body that I could scrape and collect clusters of cells which could then be recorded under a microscope, which I could then photograph. I think I employ strategies of subduction luring you into the space of the work so that despite yourself you're drawn in and a fundamentally aggressive approach would tend to stop the viewer becoming immersed. Working on the meat lamps, similar period which was, again, visualising the interior of the body, but rather than it being truly human biological material and mine, I work with uh, flesh from the butcher's shop. 
And the Vora landscape set up a kind of distant panorama which fuses the microscopic and the wider perspective. Whereas the meat lamps are much more intimate encounters with equivalents for our bodies. We read them as a kind of equivalent for a human organism, I think, or a projection of what we feel about our bodies. I photographed this huge piece of steak, but laid it out with a kind of, well, there's a view to it being on the front and the back of a book, so that the book felt like a piece of body in your hands. But those two images were also presented as the diptych and fleshings, which could either be shown side by side or opposite one another so that you pass between them. And in a way, they're the most, I can't say extreme, that's the wrong connotation, the most direct and um, fundamental of the meat lamps, because it just is what it is, energy and flesh. There was stuff all over a house, but every bit of stuff had its own little space. And I think that's how she worked. Although she worked with stuff, it wasn't clagging and it wasn't sort of all mixed up and confused. The space it held was very specified, but it was also very empathetic with what it was put with. And I think that came from the way she worked with it in her sort of tactile kind of approach to things. Because when she picked things up, when, when you just asked me that and you went like this, and that's exactly what she used to do. I can still see her hands now like this. And when she talked, she would go mm, like this, you know. And it, so she felt everything physically that she worked with. I think she has often been misunderstood because she used her own body and because she used body parts and everything and she was not afraid of smell or muck or mess or dirge. Um, the people think that she's, she's a sensationalist and she's not. She's actually probably one of the most deep thinking artists that I've come across. One of the pieces I really like of hers is the piss flowers and you know the way she described she was in love and she went to this cold place and her and her boyfriend were pissing in the snow and you know it's just so romantic this idea that sort of she incorporated her love life into this very strange object. To me the surprise was that I would want to show anything that was made by pissing in the snow. Sometimes I look at them and I think, gosh, they're amazing, they're fabulous. And they're truly fabulous in that you just can't really account for how they could be like that. I guess because they're not devised in the conventional way, they're not things made. They're the product of things that happen, chance things. Even if there was a kind of predetermined script or choreography for how they were made. They're as implausible as, you know, the delicacy of an elephant. 
or the way a bumblebee can fly. It shouldn't be, but they are and it does it. The pith flowers. I mean, yet again you have what's quite a complex process which makes a very instantly communicatable, readable image. You have Helen and her partner literally making piss holes in the snow. She was on a residency in Banff in Canada and there was lots of snow and that's what they did. So Helen does the female pee, long, deep hole. Her partner does the sprinkly one. They cast it in the finest of plaster and then cast it in bronze. And of course, in reverse, you have the female, if you like, making the phallic stamen and the male making the sprinkly corolla. So you've got this sort of hermaphrodite inverted sexual form. And then in a typical Helen final piece of irreverence, they're cut out in these kind of daisy forms. So they're like the sort of termites nests, but cut out in almost like a Mary Quant daisy, with not a great big plinth, but a sort of bulbous stalk, rather like a kind of 1960s bar stool. You have a total reversal of monumental bronze with all its cultural baggage, but it's very much bronze. You can only get that very fine quality by pouring plaster into these various holes. She showed them at the Serpentine on AstroTurf. So up they sprout like these monstrous daisies. And they're just extraordinary images too. <laughs> It takes 850 kilos of chocolate, and at the moment there is about 400 in here. It's commodities grade milk chocolate, comes in little buttons, so it looks like the type you give your dog. We just sort of pour it in the fountains evenly, and then mix it in. At the moment, I'm putting about 25 kilos in per hour. The chocolate is going into a, a hole over there in the fountain. And if the hole goes in a pipe, through a pump over here, out through another pipe, underneath the fountain, and up through this central bit here, and out through the top. You can see this is all nice hot chocolate from here. Like some? By the time the exhibition opens next Tuesday, it's been cooking for a week. And there will be all sorts of really nasty little bacteria and God knows what else growing here by then. So it won't be anything to kill you, but it'll probably uh, make you a bit sick. I wouldn't eat it, just put it that way. I think you got some in your lips. Certainly another crucial work of hers is the big chocolate fountain in Cacao, when we've got this round pool of molten chocolate which bubbles and blocks in a kind of lava-like way with this phallic stalk of a fountain sticking up in the middle down which the chocolate flows and it's encased in this perfect white sort of pond-like container raised so you've got this bubbling mass it's seductive it's repulsive it's almost like the kind of beginning of the world you expect sort of, you know, amoeboid forms to come out of it it's very sexy it's also very strange chocolate has all these connotations of course as well I mean, the chocolate fountain is like shit. I mean, and there's definitely a penile erection in the middle of this shit. I mean, no question about it. I think creative talent comes from strange sources. And originality cannot really be prescribed or traced that clearly. I remember that she's... One of her first memories is is making mud pies in a public park and being scolded by gardeners. And <laughs> when she told me that, I said, so nothing much has changed then, has it?
I remember when we first got it going in the serpentine and whacked the covers on, I had no idea what the thing was going to be like. And I remember saying, well, we've got it going, and everyone was terribly relieved and excited. I said, yeah, but is it or not? And I really don't know, because it is a phenomenon. Around this fountain are what she called her wreaths to pleasure, or bad blooms, which are these flowers massed in and around various household fluids. So you have tulip heads massed very closely around a kind of inky pool of oil in the center. So again, you have a sense of all kinds of boundaries being broken, toxic chemical, fragile organic, very sexily arranged as well. They often look quite sort of phallic or sort of vulva-like. But not in a very overt way, but as we all know, you know, flowers, as they put it so beautifully, with Mel and I are tarts for the bees, you know, so you have the sense, if you like, of all this gendering and kind of lushness taking place. And one mustn't forget Helen's aesthetic, you know. She had a tremendous eye for detail, for the actual beauty of these blooms. And she knew perfectly well what it meant in a kind of post-feminist world for a female artist to be playing around with flowers. And she did it in a very subversive and, and sexy way. Very crucially, the way in which she framed these masses of flowers framed in the most rigorous of geometric containers. So you have, if you like, this kind of geometric precision containing and framing chaotic organic matter. And she did this all the way through. And this is, I think, what gave her work a lot of formal underpinning, which then also flagged up the conceptual underpinning, this rigor again that I was talking about, this rigor of presentation and this rigor of thought. The day before yesterday, and the day before that, so for the last two days, I've been down at um, Real World, which is the kind of production village centre of Peter Gabriel. And they've asked me to construct a sculpture which will be animated on a CD-ROM, an interactive CD-ROM, to kind of go with one of his records. So I've built this wigwam of flowers which is a very simple straightforward thing although it did have an extraordinary presence on the lawn there and I was filmed doing that and that will then be incorporated into these sequences I'm quite glad I've done it actually or I'm working on it and initially it was just a small commission to make something which they could photograph but I was kind of interested in how I could collaborate with them for the sculpture to come alive, if you like, which is, of course, what can happen on these computer programs, so that different aspects of it can be explored and the viewer can kind of take off into by kind of clicking it in certain ways with the uh, cursor. Among the works that Helen Chadwick created just before her death is Nebula, part of a group called Unnatural Selection. Central to this are her photographs of embryos generated for couples going through in vitro fertilization treatment. Helen's core concerns were extremely ambitious. 
If you think about the work that she did at the end of her life with the fetuses that she created into jewels, the reference was to Victorian mourning jewellery, but she also wanted us to see that these fetuses were very precious. These were fetuses that had been discarded from in vitro fertilization schemes. They had been picked out as not promising good babies. And she was very interested in that, where the line of the outcast, where the line of the reject is drawn. And she wanted to blur that. She wanted to change that. The necklace piece in the jewels that she made with the discarded fetuses really shows her concerns with great economy. She had a great economy, because we see there some of the cells that have divided, which have been discarded, two dandelion clocks, which of course represent the absolute delicacy of nature's regularity and order. And then in the center, an eye that has a cataract. And that is technically known in medicine as nebula, which means cloud. And she's drawing attention with that to the beauty that is possible and inherent, even in things that are damaged or not standard. But she's also, I think, subliminally telling us that we shouldn't trust eyes, that eyes can be clouded. And that's the old ideas about what vision looks for. That's not the only canon of beauty, but there are other canons of beauty. The last time I saw Helen, I went to her studio to see the cameos. She'd finished two of them, and she was working on the third. And they were really too radical for me at the time. I, I, I now see what she was doing, and of course I've also got used to them. But I had uh, the, the very conventional response of rejection of the Cyclops baby, for example, who is enshrined in the first one. And Helen said of herself, I instantly felt this sort of deep compassion and love of this creature. She was instituting a new set of values. For her, this singularity of the baby with the one eye was something to be appreciated. And she enshrines it in a set of forms that in a way recalls geometric modernism. So she's saying we have one aesthetic, which is this kind of bare, minimal uh, circles floating in an ellipse, and we think of that as austere and beautiful, but I actually see in the Cyclops baby something similar, some form of order that is also possible. When Helen died, and the piece that she was working on was basically about the whole concept of life and the selection of the embryo, and she was talking about life, to die in the middle of the most controversial work that I think she ever made, it seemed like, ah, oh, she also died of a virus. I mean, it can never, the inquest, the post-mortem, they can never be absolutely sure, but it looks like she died of myocarditis, which is a virus which attacks the heart muscles. And Helen was in the Architectural Association and just said that she didn't feel well and wanted to sit down. And before she sat on the chair, she had fallen over dead. I think it's always very dangerous to look at artists' work sort of through the prism of their autobiography, and particularly as in the case of Helen when she died such a tragic and early and unexpected death. But I think having said that, there's no doubt that the whole sense of passing time, life and death, she talked about it a lot. She talked about this notion with her unnatural selection, the embryo pieces of Homer Bullus, Man is but a bubble. It's irony upon irony that she died so young. It's irony upon irony that she was involved with all these kind of key elements of our existence and of life. But I don't think she had some kind of death wish that ran through her career. But I, I certainly think it was a preoccupation, the fragility of our existence, and hers proved to be very fragile. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
She wrote this poem when uh, she uh, made the Piss Flowers, her famous notorious piece that <laughs> she made. Um, and, um, all right. Drink me harder, my delight. Swell to bursting, pretty sluice, and piss a posy deeper, dear. Here, into my snow white rain, rogue about my pistol shot, hot juice as if a bumblebee would lick my petals. Pollinate me for centre stage the golden crown, ring-a-ring a dandelion, molten amber all falls down, Cassulphorus, how nature's art does freeze our bold indifference. Void now volume, daggled plume, bespattered all around love's spume, locked together, you and I. Bind a hybrid daisy chain, organs doubled, two a bed, and by a floral rhyming wed, Linnaeus, what would you say? How to find such wanton play? Stop it, 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 stop it